Havana, Cuba's socialist capital, an architectural jewel starved of funds for its upkeep by decades of US sanctions. But now relations with America are improving. Is this beautiful but crumbling city about to experience a speculator-led revival? In the last of three special reports on Cuba's growing accord with capitalism, Juliana Rufus goes in search of the winners and losers from Havana's property renaissance. This is a slum tenement in Old Havana, Cuba. The residents want us to see how they're living. Half a century ago, when Fidel Castro's revolutionary forces entered the capital Havana, it was the lives of the poor that the new leader promised to improve by putting an end to capitalist excess. One of Castro's key measures was the elimination of the property market as a lucrative business. Housing was declared a human right, private rental was abolished, and the majority of Cubans were given free properties to live in. But with the U.S. embargo declared on the revolutionary island and its finances dependent on an inefficient, state-driven economy, the government ran out of money. Vast parts of Havana fell into decline. In a radical move, the government opened up the economy in 2011 and property laws were reversed. Cubans were allowed to buy and sell their homes once more. The government says its revolutionary vision hasn't changed and that the reforms are aimed at keeping rather than dismantling socialism. But does the reintroduction of private property bring changes for Havana's urban poor? And how will the government deal with a wealthy new class that the regime once fought so hard to defeat? Plaza de Armas, Havana's oldest square. We've arranged to meet Aline Robaina, chief architect for the Office of the Historian. It's a branch of the government responsible for the rehabilitation of Havana's historical center. It all started right here in this space. This is the square where the first archaeological works were developed. This is the area where the historian's office was settled as an office. It's an immensely powerful institution which publishes a master plan that serves as a blueprint for Havana's development. At its core is the idea of using income from tourism to fund the renovation of the city and in 2011 alone it generated $120 million in revenue. Here at the Plaza Vieja, some of the old mansions have been developed into businesses. Few of them had um, slums, very poor housing in very bad conditions in the 1980s. And when they were fixed, they were converted into microbrewery, for example, that was occupied by a lot of families. But it is also the goal of the master plan to keep as many of the original residents as possible living in the city center. That still has housing. But instead of having 50 families living in a very poor, overcrowded condition, now we have five or six apartments. And these people, these families, pay rent to the government. But it's subsidized. Eileen takes us to see a family who have been allocated a renovated apartment. The Perez family have been living here since Mylene Perez pleaded hardship with the office of the historian. Uh, both Perez are working for the tourism industry and earn a competitive wage. But the average Cuban is employed by the state and earns just $25 per month. 
The subsidy system means that the Perez family's monthly rent is fixed at 4% of the state's salary, or just $1. But back in the square, we find out that the current economic changes do make it harder to keep the original residents in the city. Increasingly, housing is converted privately into cafes and bars. Some of the families that used to live in these upper floors owned their places. And according to the law that we have right now, places that are in private ownership can be sold. So these families have been tempted because they have been offered a very large amount of money for their spaces because there is a big demand for this lovely area surrounding the colonial squares. Further down the road, the government is building new apartment blocks. And who will be given the housing in the new building? So probably the families that live around in some of the slums nearby will get this new housing so we can come to these buildings in order to start uh, rehabilitation. Suddenly an argument arises. A group of local residents fear being pushed out by the new businesses. No digas eso, chico. No digas eso, que tú no sabes. They don't, they, they're saying they don't trust they're going to get the apartment. Es vivienda, pero al final no se sabe a quién se lo van a dar. Ah, no se sabe. Vamos a salir con las cámaras, la verdad, no se sabe a quién se lo van a dar. No se sabe. No se sabe, no se sabe a quién se lo van a dar. ¿Tú sabes cuál era lo bello? ¿Tú sabes cuál era lo bello? Esa gente que están aquí, que viven toda una vida aquí, que sus hijos nacieron aquí, que tienen sus escuelas aquí, no lo manden para Cambute, no lo manden para la yuca. Over 40 families live in this former mansion. Nicolas Sanchez takes us around. 200,000 out of Havana's 2.2 million residents live in conditions like these. There's no rent to pay, but it's incredibly cramped. Nicolás's relatives have partitioned one large room to house two families. Esto es una sola casa, ¿no? Mira esto aquí, porque esto no existía. No ve cómo lo estamos construyendo, porque de lo mismo que sobre en la construcción enfrente. Porque mira cómo vivimos. Si el Estado no repara, tenemos que repararlo nosotros. Baño ese se tiene salidero completo. No tengo dónde bañarme. Todo lo que cae de arriba, mira, cae para abajo. Todo eso se moja. Corre. De allá arriba, del otro piso más arriba. Constantemente. Nicolás's mother, Manta, was given the original room by the Castro government after the revolution. Yo vine de Oriente. Yo fui combatiente de la sierra. Se suponía que era algo para que vivan, pero no que la familia se iba a proliferar así tanto. Porque cuántos niños... Somos nosotros. Sí. Hay un enfermo con convulsión. Cuatro, cuatro hembras y dos varones. They have added an extra floor to sleep on. De arriba cae agua. Entonces yo tenía el escaparate ahí, que era donde ponía la ropa, y se me mojó todo y tuve que botar el escaparate. Y botar muchas cosas porque no tenía, no tengo donde donde poner la, la ropa ni nadie, entonces lo, mira cómo la tengo venda así. Manta's epileptic son is resting on his bed. On the other side of the partition is Manta's granddaughter. Analí. Analí, te llama una muchacha. Analí lives on the other side with her mother, Mary Lady. I ask Mary Lady if she has tried to get a job in the tourism industry, but she says it's tough unless you have connections.
When we see Eileen again, she says she can understand the residents' complaints. Perfect situation would be to have enough new housing to give to all of them. But there are many limitations. So do you think people are suspicious that the government will not act in their interest? No, I wouldn't say suspicious. The problem is that they have been waiting for a solution to their problems for a long time. We haven't been efficient enough to solve them for practical reasons, because the country has made priorities in education or health care, and then housing has been waiting too long. Havana's authorities are facing an uphill struggle to preserve the city, not just overcrowding and structural alterations, but also damage caused by the high humidity are making buildings unsafe. It falls to Julio Rosado Varela, the city's chief building inspector, to decide which houses are so unsafe that they need to be destroyed. <laughs> Last year alone, one building collapsed in Havana every second day. Esto se entra de moler porque aparte de estar en mal estado, eh, es un agrego a la edificación eh, original como estaba. Los usuarios entendieron de hacer un entrepiso de vía de billete y bobedía. Pero en realidad, eh, aunque bueno, aparentemente eh, se ve muy fuerte a la hora de la demolición, pero está en mal estado y entonces por eso hay que demolerlo de todas maneras. The inspector says the demolition will take his men three or four days. It really hurts to see this. It's quite painful. Sí, que estamos eliminando una vivienda, una una residencia de alguna persona que hubo que trasladar o que hubo que ubicar en otro lugar y que no tiene las mismas condiciones y eso es un poco difícil. How many houses do you think need destroying? And you know, how how can you deal with this problem? Aquí hoy en el momento en la Habana Vieja hay bastante casas de moler, muchas. Estaríamos hablando de miles. Recognizing Cuba's urgent need for more housing in the 1960s, the Castro government began building Soviet-style prefabricated satellite cities, with several of them located around Havana. Once highly desirable, today, they have become the destination for those who can no longer be housed in the capital. Luis Rodriguez and Felix Sanchez moved to Alamar 15 years ago when their building in Old Havana was turned into a hotel. The government gives families here free apartments, but for many, property ownership is a small consolation for a big transition. Was it difficult to come here from Old Havana? Was it a difficult change for you? Al principio sí. Al principio era un cambio porque eh, ya estaba adaptado a amistades, eh, los lugares me quedaban más cerca, más céntricos. Eh, y ahí cuando vine para acá era totalmente diferente. Todo era totalmente diferente. Ya me fui poco a poco a través de pasos, los años eso, te fue, fui conociendo más personas, hice nuevas amistades y fui mejorando, ¿ya entiendes? Luis works at a nearby refinery, and it turns out that Felix is in construction, building houses for those who still arrive from Havana. We've asked them to take us to meet the latest arrivals. Hola. Hola. Juliette Hernandez had to leave Havana three months ago. Her home became unsafe after a building collapsed next door. Fui corriendo ahí a tratar de salvar a las personas. Y yo fui quien saqué el niñito del año y a la mamá. Que nos mandaron para aquí para la mar. Mi vida me cambió. Drásticamente, completamente me cambió. The government has given Juliet and her children this three-bedroom flat. So what was the choice that the government gave you? No, ninguna elección. Para aquí, si no, íbamos para un albergue. Y rápido, los camiones estaban allá abajo, no teníamos opción, teníamos que recoger y teníamos, estábamos traumatizados por los muertos. Yo dije, bueno. 
Juliette would have preferred a new home in Havana. Now it takes her two hours by bus to commute into work. Luis tries to cheer her up. We had been hearing repeatedly about temporary shelters on the outskirts of Havana. We're trying to find one called La Yuca. Whole communities have been stuck in these camps for years, we've been told. We arrive and meet Dulce Maria Gutierrez and her friend Jamila Leon. Hola, Juliana, Juliana, Dulce. Dulce, ¿cuál es tu nombre? Jamila. Jamila. Ellas vienen de La Habana Vieja también. The women moved to La Yuca together with six other families when their house in Old Havana collapsed. Aquí llevamos ahora en estos momentos allá. The family of five shares one room. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Dulce gets a little extra income from selling homemade ice cream. But lack of housing isn't the only problem here. The women also complain about lead in the soil surrounding the camp and environmental pollution from a nearby factory. Ha habido muchos problemas de salud. Pero no era solamente el plomo, había un la fosa estaba rota. Hace mucho tiempo vistiendo que todavía está rota. Y eso es otra contaminación porque son aguas negras las que vierten. Y había muchos niños que le salían grano y empezamos a preocuparnos. Y bueno, se ha ido, sí, impétigo y muchas alergias, muchas alergias. Muchos niños the women más. say that before the collapse of their old building, they had spent years writing letters asking to be rehoused. Ironically, it is only now that problems have been discovered in La Yuca that their dream of owning a house may finally become a reality. When or where, they don't yet know. Do you think the government has the money to build new housing? No. El dinero no lo tiene. Cuba, Cuba no tiene, intenciones tiene, pero realmente no tenemos presupuesto. No tenemos presupuesto. Bastante hacen, pero no alcanza, entiende. No es solamente Habana Vieja. Hay otros municipios que están muy viejos y presentan las mismas complicaciones constructivas. El deterioro es general, no es solamente Habana Vieja. Y el Estado no puede con todo. The government hopes that allowing private real estate will help stimulate the economy. It's an opportunity that was taken up swiftly. In the first week of 2011 alone, 750,000 Cuban homeowners went to register their properties. Every Sunday, one of Havana's main avenues, Prado, turns into an informal real estate market. Quite a few of the sellers here are putting their houses onto the market to generate cash that will allow them to set up a business. In a country that offers few former lines of credit, this creates genuine new opportunities. But some of the most successful business ventures are opened by Cubans who have been drawn by the changes to return from abroad. Yadaguia runs point to Cuba, one of Havana's most upmarket real estate agencies. So this is the mansion built in 1933. It's an Art Deco house. It has eight bedrooms and five bathrooms. This is the dining room. Um, has a lot of lights, high ceiling, beautiful marble on the floor. A villa like this will set a buyer back around $850,000 and each successful sale adds new members to Havana's growing middle class. But Cuba's real estate is so attractive that the government has set limits. In order to keep the country's housing stock in Cuban hands, foreigners are restricted from buying most properties. Who then are the people who are buying? Mostly Cubans that live abroad are buying the most beautiful houses because they are the most expensive one. A staggering $1 billion is now flowing from American Cubans to their island relatives each year. It's a huge driving force behind the purchase of upmarket real estate. As you see, it's very, the concept is very open. You have the living room, the dining room, and then access to the beautiful out outdoor space. Here you can just relax. Yolanda Fernandez is an industrial designer who lives between Cuba and Mexico. Being permitted to sell her property prompted her to invest money in its renovation, hoping a profitable sale will pay for a move abroad. Me gustaría alguien que realmente 
este, la, la mantuviera. Y la apreciara. Eh, hay, hay algo que la gente que tiene mucho dinero y tiene mal gusto es una combinación horrible. <risa> sí, y la pueden bueno. destruir <risa> en un minuto. Yolanda's house used to look just like the one next door. And the hope is that investments such as these won't just pay off for the owners, they will also create income across the economy as a whole. But I'm about to meet a far bigger player who's also eyeing Havana's real estate. Hugo Cancio is a Cuban who fled the island to live in Miami during the times of economic hardship. Today, he's an entrepreneur and art collector. He has returned to Havana to speak to the government about a series of large investments. This is where we come to get inspired, to get motivated, to understand, to feel, to smell Havana. Even in chaos, even in this, this colored city, I see, you know, a tremendous amount of beauty and an opportunity. Hugo publishes magazines on art and real estate and says he's about to launch tech startups. Our website on Cuba.com is the most read website in the world about Cuba. And this is where our journalists and editors do their jobs. Hola. Ding, ding. As a Cuban-American and as the owner of a Miami-based holding company, Hugo says he is the perfect man to bring new business. Who better than me? This is my country of origin. You know, I lived 35 years um, um, in the United States. I bring expertise, know-how, uh, resources, and passion and love. That combination is a powerful combination. Until the U.S. Congress lifts the economic embargo, it's difficult for American citizens to invest in Cuba. But Hugo claims American money is ready and waiting. We have raised uh, um, a lot of money, um, a lot of money, tens of millions of dollars, to be ready to invest in the real estate market once it becomes available and once it becomes legal under U.S. laws. If I've understood you right, you've set up a fund to be <coughs> ready to invest once that is possible. Is that correct? Um, yes, yeah, that is correct. We are, we are launching... Uh, a uh, $300 million fund uh, that is to invest in Cuba in general. In those particular sectors, technology, telecommunication, real estate. I want to be able to say, who do I write the check to? And I think that's key. Back in Old Havana, the government is already working on construction sites with foreign companies. This former shopping mall, Manzana de Gomez, is being turned into a luxury hotel. We can actually go inside and see. No, this is an investment that is not part of the project of the historian's office. The development is a partnership between Cuba's tourism company Gaviota, the French construction company Buick Batmont, and the luxury hotel chain Kempinski. They have to say what they want in terms of the conditions of the room, and uh, so they have their designers and uh, people of their teams participating with the Cuban. Uh, to many observers, it looks like capitalism is sneaking into Cuba through the back door. Do, do you ever worry that some of the foreign companies that are coming in may not share the vision that you have in how Cubans will live in Cuba? Yeah, I'm definitely scared about that. Maybe they don't even share it now. I mean, they're doing business. It's our responsibility to make that happen.